Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former health commissioner here in Baltimore. Our goal is to bring evidence and experience to illuminate critical public health issues. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health on Call, and today Stephanie Desmond talks to Michelle Mello, a professor of law and public policy at Stanford University. They discuss vaccine mandates, how effective they are, how practical they are, and what the mixed success of COVID vaccine mandates could mean for any future pandemic. Let's listen. Michelle Mello, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. So you are an expert on vaccine mandates. And so I really want to talk to you today about how effective COVID vaccine mandates have been in improving vaccination rates and reducing disease. So we don't uh, have a great deal of what I might call hard evidence about that. I'm not aware yet of studies that have systematically examined the impact of employer mandates, which is mostly what we've had to date, uh, is managed through large employers and through federal contractors. Uh, so what, mostly what we have is accumulating reports from different entities that have imposed vaccination requirements. And what we hear in those reports is that there's very high levels of compliance with the requirement. Opt-out rates are low. And so if the question is, you know, do most employees comply when an employer requires them to take the vaccine? The answer is, is yes, most do. Another useful analog, though, because we don't have direct evidence yet about COVID vaccines, is to look at the much better developed evidence base about school entry vaccination mandates. And what we know about those is um, very high levels of compliance. Again, opt-out rates vary by state and by locality, but are in the 1% to 2% range, maybe as high as 5% in some places. And we also know that there are very strong statistical associations between having a vaccination requirement for school entry and particularly a relatively stringent one for which opt-out opportunities are limited and risk of having a disease outbreak as well as overall rates of vaccine preventable illness in that area. So vaccine mandates can be very effective is what we're saying here. And we presume that we will see the same with COVID vaccines. But I guess The concern probably is that people don't like these vaccine mandates, and this seems to be a very controversial topic. And I'm wondering why a place that's been fairly compliant with regular routine vaccinations is sort of losing its mind over these uh, COVID requirements. Yeah, well, I mean, before I answer that, I will say I'm not sure it it is going to be the case that we're going to see levels of uptake for COVID vaccines that are comparable to what we've seen, you know, once time has passed for other vaccination mandates. And and the big difference, of course, is we're not talking about school entry mandates. We're talking about mandates that are imposed through other mechanisms. And as time wears on, those mechanisms are unraveling a little bit in many places around the country because of judicial decisions The landscape is different than for school entry vaccines, which have a very robust uh, legal defensibility. They come into question from time to time, but it's just not an issue in the way that it is for COVID vaccines. And, you know, it's, it's also different when we're talking about mandates that aren't through schools because the enforcement mechanism is, is different. It's harder to verify in many ways. Many employers don't like these mandates. They don't want to go along with them. They may be reluctant to take the steps that they might otherwise take to to verify this. So uh, I think overall, the effectiveness is um, likely to be lower than it is for school entry mandates. And so the question that you asked then is, well, what's what's the issue here? Uh, And I think there are, you know, kind of two issues at core. One, of course, is that this issue has become insanely politicized for lots and lots of reasons that we can talk about. People who identify as Republicans uh, really have a strong resistance to to taking this vaccine and then unsurprisingly to being told to take this vaccine. Um, And that resistance continues to be fomented by forces ranging from, um, 
you know, pretty fringe anti-vaccination groups that have a strong presence on social media on up to mass media outlets that have really helped to promulgate misinformation about vaccines and a sense that a swath of the American public that identifies as right-leaning should think of themselves as being under siege by government requirements um, and should resist more generally. The second factor is that the vaccines are relatively new. So compared to polio vaccines or measles vaccines that have been around for a long time, the evidence base for their safety is somewhat lower because we just don't have as much long-term data on that. That reason, though, for resistance is sort of diminishing over time. A lot of people have had COVID vaccines at this point. We know a lot at this point about their safety. So the kinds of reasons that people were giving a year ago for not wanting to get vaccinated really are pretty hard to maintain at this point, except for the youngest group of kids for which these vaccines were just approved. You know, the concern there is you know, it's not fully FDA approved. It's it's through this emergency use mechanism and the clinical trials supporting that emergency approval are smaller than they were in adults. And that means statistically, we have a lower chance of detecting adverse effects that are rare. We've seen, as you mentioned earlier, the court siding against some vaccine mandates. Do you worry that that could trickle down to other vaccines in the future? I'm not worried that courts are going to tell state governments that they can't require school entry vaccines. The legal issues are very different when you're talking about a federal requirement because states have, as a constitutional matter, something known as the police power and something to do with law enforcement. It is the the general and very broad constitutional power that states have to enact laws of every description to promote public health as long as they're reasonable and necessary. So that principle has been around for as long as courts have been deciding cases about public health law. To do something comparable, the federal government has to find another source of constitutional power And that's why you see it limiting its mandates to entities that it has some kind of existing regulatory relationship with, because it can't just require every man, woman, and child in America to get a vaccine. So the legal issues are different. Having said that, there are and will continue to be skirmishes around the margins of school entry mandates, specifically around the scope of religious liberty when it comes to uh, seeking exemptions from those mandates. Not all states recognize religious exemptions. And uh, among those that do, it's actually very undeveloped as a legal matter what they can require as a showing. If if you want to offer a religious exemption as an employer, it's very clear in the law exactly how you go about that because it's a matter of federal regulation. But when constitutional law is implicated, there's a lot of squishiness and vagueness. And so people are now coming forward pressing claims about their religious liberty that are pretty unusual. Like I'm a Catholic, and even though the Catholic Church and the Pope has said no problem in terms of taking the COVID vaccine, my belief, my interpretation of Catholic doctrine is that I shouldn't. So these are the kinds of claims that are going to be litigated going forward. Do you have concern sort of about the future when it comes to the next public health crisis? It seems like vaccines were not a slam dunk. As I don't know, someone like me, who's very much immersed in public health, thought they would have been. Right. So I think everybody has been surprised that this has become such an issue. And the real question is, when will our next big pandemic be? And what will our polity look like at that point in time? Will we still be in this state of extreme political polarization, fracturing of social solidarity, of, of resistance to government assertions of authority? Or will things have kind of equilibrated back to where they've usually been, which is that, you know, that the Republican Party is a little bit more center than the far right. And um, most people recognize that it's a good thing to be free of pandemics and that, you know, there's not really any need for a political party to take on vaccination as an issue. So I'd like to think we'll get back there. I hope we do. If things remain as they are, then, yeah, I wouldn't expect the next time we need to do this to be much different. Again, especially because we'd be developing and talking less likely about a new vaccine, an emergent uh, infectious agent that hasn't been seen before. And so all of these you know, issues will, will likely come up next time. There's one big point of uncertainty, though, and that is how bad would that infectious agent be? You know, there are lots of things about 
SARS-CoV-2 that made it possible for people to tell themselves, I don't need to be vaccinated. You know, most people don't die. It doesn't seem to harm kids very much relative to how much it harms people who are on the other end of the life cycle. I think I can protect myself. If we're dealing with an agent where those things are no longer true, you know, higher case fatality rates, children being infected and harmed in high numbers, um, very high rates of hospitalization, these kinds of things might change Americans' minds about the importance of vaccination. What do you see going forward, sort of, do you, are we going to still be talking about vaccine mandates for COVID sort of in the near term, or is this something that's sort of just going to be dropped, do you think? Well, I think that there will still be talk about it. I mean, there's litigation still pending right now about these federal mandates uh, that apply to contractors and large employers. And there's, you know, a patchwork of decisions around that that, not surprisingly, vary depending on the political leanings of the judges who are involved in those cases. Um, and as I said, there are there's ongoing litigation about religious objections to vaccination. Um, but there's also the ongoing question about schools. And, you know, we're in a moment right now where um, we're, we're not getting the signal from CDC or other high levels of government that we should be treating COVID like a crisis that would require very strong measures like vaccination mandates in schools. Um, there is vigorous disagreement in the public health community about whether that's the right way to think about COVID. Um, but there are school districts, for example, in the District of Columbia that have required COVID vaccines for students this fall. So in those places, um, there will be debate. There may be interest in other areas in thinking about D.C.'s experience as we head into fall, another possible surge. Who knows what variants on the horizon? It, you know, if, if, we're, if we can no longer say we're at a place where, uh, you know, deaths or, and cases are low enough that we should be thinking about this more like the flu and just something we have to live with. This issue will come up again. But for the time being, you know, it, it hasn't been the case that a lot of school districts are moving towards requiring this vaccination right now. I feel as though the sort of general policy, the feel at the moment to me is that we've decided maybe this is over and that we don't really want to deal with it anymore and just sort of going back to whatever life was before. For example, my son's a freshman in college and he happens to be sitting here instead of in class because he got COVID and there was, so he couldn't go to class and he, they wouldn't take him into an isolation dorm. So I had to go pick him up. There's no such thing anymore as isolation dorms, apparently. And so I guess what I'm wondering is, you know, how do you foresee that as affecting people's reluctance or not reluctance for vaccines? Yeah, I'm really sorry that your family is going through that. It, it just throws everything into chaos. Even if you believe things will turn out okay because your son's vaccinated, it still causes so much chaos when uh, when COVID cases pop up in families and schools. You know, it's uh, people have sort of complained that at the same time, the CDC is is more or less sending a message that we don't need strict community mitigation measures in place anymore. And by that, I mean things like closure orders or restrictions on um, social gatherings. They're also saying y'all need to get out and get the boosters ASAP. So <laughs> some people wonder, how can both of those things be true? Is it bad or is it not bad? Do I need to be worried or do I not need to be worried? You know, I, I think the way to think about this is that there are many, many illnesses to which we remain vulnerable and which kill um, hundreds to thousands of people uh, every year and which we ought to be getting vaccinated against as often as is medically recommended, you know. Seasonal flu is in that category. People, of course, think about the flu as something irritating, but not awful. But when you look at the death rates from seasonal influenza, they are truly staggering. You know, anywhere from you know low teens, thousands per year, 12, 13,000 a year on up. In some years, over 50,000 Americans die of flu every year. So there are lots of diseases that we, um, quote unquote, live with and don't change our lifestyle very much because of that are still really awful and we need to be vaccinated against them. Um, so maybe we're shifting into an area where most of us, although certainly not all, feel like COVID, once we're vaccinated, is no longer so severe a threat that we want to change our lifestyle very much because of it. But we nevertheless ought to be vaccinated. And indeed, those two things are related. You know, if our population immunity begins to wane because people are not remaining fully up to date on their vaccination, then there's a greater need for those other things that burden our lifestyles so much more. Michelle Mello, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. 
Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Spencer Greer, and Matthew Martin with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Holes Fernandez and Amber Bryan Singletary. Thank you for listening. Thank you.